Welcome everybody. This is Heather Riggs with the New England Museum Association. I want to welcome to you today on a little bit of a muggy day if you're here in New England um, to this panel with Tim Groh from History Relevance and Ken Torino from Historic New England. They will be having a discussion about History Relevance and I think after um, the past couple weeks I think this is definitely a good topic to be discussing um, today and stuff like that. So Tim I'm going to push it over to you if you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, History Relevance and you could probably start sharing your screen now. And also just to let you guys do know, uh, we are recording the session today and it will be available on the NEMA website um, later this afternoon. Okay, thanks Heather. I'm Tim Grove and I have a consulting company called Grove History Consulting. I'm based in Falls Church, right outside DC. And um, I got involved with History Relevance um, kind of as a result of, of the interest in STEM and and then STEAM, and then it was the question of where's history? Why are people not talking about history? And um, a few of us got together uh, and started asking that question. And, and it's not a new conversation by any means. Um, where is history is not a new conversation, but we haven't been doing something right in the field. So we thought, well, perhaps we need to be more articulate about why we're relevant as organizations and as history, as a discipline, and maybe we need a more unified language, and maybe we um, need to start gathering more data um, so that we can demonstrate our relevance as a whole. And so that's kind of kind of what we're trying to do. We're all volunteers. If you go to historyrelevance.com, you can see our effort. We're all busy with full-time day jobs, and so um, we, we try to produce tools every now and then, and I'll share two tools that we've developed for the field with the help of the field um, as we go along here today. But this, our session is kind of a big overview of, of, of relevance as I've, I do workshops, day workshops on relevance. I've taught at Seminar for Historical Administration, now History Leadership Institute. Um, so we've been talking relevance a lot of uh, places around the country. So I'm really thrilled that New England uh, is interested in, in having conversations about relevance. I, I'm sure that you all already are talking about relevance. Um, I know Ken is. So um, that's a little bit about me. Ken, do you want to say something about yourself? Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, Ken Torino, um, I work as manager of community partnerships and resource development at Historic New England. Um, I am also vice president of the board of the House of Seven Gables. So I've got that side to my work. And then I teach in the Tufts Museum Studies Program and with Max von Bogley uh, in the AASLH uh, series on historic houses that we do around the country. So uh, yes, and I do talk about relevance a lot, and I will in this presentation. Tim? So we are going to move fast and furiously, and uh, let's see. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. Can you see the screen? Yes? Yep, you're good. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, we're going to start with a very quick exercise. I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures of people that I'm sure you are familiar with. And um, think about whether this person is relevant or not. And I know we have not defined relevance. And I think you're all going to realize that there's not one definition of relevance necessarily. Um, but let's just go through some of these pictures. Is this person relevant or not? Actually, think about it. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in a, in a minute once we have seen them all.
Normally I would have you raise your hands and I would see who, who thinks who's relevant, but can't see you. There's a chance that you won't all know who every person is either. So, um, variety of people there. Um, any thoughts? Let's see. Uh, feel free to type in some of your thoughts. Um, obviously, not everyone is going to agree on if one of the people that I showed, say Oprah, someone might not think she's relevant. Um, relevance changes depending on your age in some parts, and so sometimes your age. Um, did some people, I'm, I'm guessing maybe some of our younger people might not even have recognized Charlton Heston, who was a huge, super huge actor. He was Moses, of course, in Ten Commandments, but he was also involved in the NRA. He was a spokesman for the National Rifle Association. Um, yeah, so Tim, we've got a couple people that have weighed in that said all are relevant. Uh, two people have said that, and then from uh, Martha, relevance is a relevant term, depending on who the audience is in time frame. Um, I got Charlton Heston wrong, right? I thought, uh, I thought he was Clint Eastwood, uh, yeah. <laughs> who turned 90 this week. Um, re relevance may also depend on the topic or subject from Liz Holbrook. Hey, Liz. So those are a couple of the responses we got. Right, so basically I, I, I like to start off with this activity because I think it, it shows that relevance is, in some ways it's in the eye of the beholder, um, but that doesn't mean we should run away from it as too impossible to try to be relevant to everyone or not. So, um, And then places, of course, can be relevant or not relevant. These are some New England places that you may recognize. Um, sometimes a, play, a historic site might be relevant because you visited on a field trip as a kid and that has great personal relevance because something happened there or you have a family vacation there. So memories that are very personal. Um, on the right, for those of you who don't know, Hartford, Connecticut, Mark Twain's home. Um, if you're a big fan of reading Mark Twain's books, that might have some deep relevance for you. Um, statue on the left, of course, is at Concord. Um, it, it, it represents certain things to certain people. So again, relevance varies with the, the beholder. T Tim? Yes. Could I jump in? Um, yes. People may have been reading in terms of relevance, you, you put up a, uh, the, the soldier from the American Revolution, but there's been so much debate just this week with Confederate statues coming up and coming down. Um, as you told me, the one in Alexandria, Virginia, where I used to work, uh, went down, you know, overnight practically this last week. Right. So that's another thing. That's something that I think a lot of our people in the audience today would think about because we've been talking about the relevance of those and how are, how are they relevant and are they relevant? What do they yeah. represent? Great point. So when, uh, off the bat, I wanna say that relevance is not the same as nostalgia, they're very different, um, but relevance does relate to personal connection. If a person has a personal connection, is it more relevant to them? So let's start to define what relevance means. Um, I'm curious what words what words come to mind when you hear the word relevant. Maybe you could type that in quick. Let's see if we have any of those. 
Well, we have relevance as an open-ended concept, meaning from Ellen Snyder. Oh, Anyone meaning. Else? Meaning, yeah. Pertinent. Connection, pertinent. Applicable to the topic, meaningful significance. Forming a connection between two things for a person. Connecting and meaning. So the second question I want to ask is, what is there a connection between relevance and value? If something, does something become more valuable if it's perceived as more relevant to an individual? Ken, can you see the comments? Yep, um, I, I can. So, so repeat your question, Tim. What is the relationship between relevance and value? Is there a relationship? Um, we've got one thing that I was going to add about that is um, I, I, I actually do uh, think that there's a, there's a big connection because I think let me talk with from my historic house hat on for a minute, that for people to be connected to our historic sites or our museums, they have to perceive them as having some value, whether it's valuable to the community, whether it's value to the, to the, um, to the society, to the nation, whatever. There has to be some preserved. Why, why else would you support unless you thought that they added value? And we've got a couple of other comments here that let me just put in here for you. And I heard from Don Salerno, yes, uh, if my museum is relevant, I consider it to be more valuable to people as such. Um, and then another, yes, it does become more valuable if it is more relevant. If it is more valuable, then you will have more visitors. Uh, it's easier to find value in something that has relevance. Good comments. Yeah, I agree. I, I actually do think there's a, a strong tie between relevance and value. And allows individual connection from Chris. Yeah. And I'm going to just in a few minutes give a personal case of value and relevance for me, but that will be coming up. So here's another question. Can content be fascinating but not relevant? Think about that for a minute. Oh, Tim, Tim and I had a debate about this the other day. I wouldn't say it was a debate. No, but... not a debate. We had a discussion, not a debate. Right. 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 Um, Hopefully everyone knows what I mean by that. Um, we've all been, I'm sure we've all been on a historic house tour or a historic site tour where we're really fascinated with the content, but we didn't feel a connection with it. We didn't feel, I mean, in, in some ways, relevance is answering the so what, why should I care? Don't you think, Ken? Yes, yes. So here, here we go. We've got a couple people are weighing in now. Uh, as a lover of, of trivia, yes, there are plenty of things that I had, I find fascinating, but not relevant. Of course, but how many people find it fascinating? Um, or at least not, or some things are not relevant all the time. And, and Tim and I talked about, you know, what about visiting a great British, you know, uh, house and just going for the aesthetics? You know, is that relevant um, if they talk about the servants and the people whose money gave the wealthy family or gave them the means to build this, well, that could be relevant. But if you're just going to look at the pretty paintings, which I have done, um, you know, that's fascinating. Or the gardens or the architecture or whatever. Right, so those can, those are cases where it's, it can be just fascinating. Um, but I think it adds meeting, Tim, for me, if you add in that relevance to it, Yes, I would say that as well. As an educator, um, I strive to go always go for a deeper level with people. 
And you can get deeper if you try to find those points of connection with them. Yeah, and, and here's a good comment from Alan Snyder. Uh, it probably depends on the beholder. If you value giving knowledge and it's fascinating, it might be relevant to you. Hmm. Okay, good comments. Okay. We're gonna come back to that actually, the fascinating but relevant. But, um, one final uh, discussion question in this point is, does relevance of history content change over time? And in some ways we've answered that a little bit with talking about the uh, Confederate statues, maybe. I think that's a, that's a, a great example um, because uh, clearly a lot of people didn't really understand a lot of the meaning behind the sculptures. Um, and that's how we made them even more relevant. I think, you know, the one in Alexandria, I walked by Tim for four years and didn't really think much about at all. It just became sort of wallpaper to me. Uh, but then when I learned the story about, you know, why these monuments were uh, erected and what they really were trying to honor and meant, it made it so much more relevant to issues going on today. Right. And let's see, we've got uh, another comment. Absolutely, our understanding of our history is constantly evolving. It's also like all the Leif Erikson um, monuments and sculptures in the Boston area to the Vikings. It's that same, why is this here? You know, and then you learn the story of it and you're like, yeah, okay, <laughs> I get this. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, let's see, uh, from um, Martha, yes it does. We still have a few early 19th century rooms set up in our museum for, for third graders. As time has passed, we see fewer and fewer adults interested in those rooms, as the literature tells us. So uh, that's an interesting comment. But clearly that serves at least your, your third graders. Yeah. So. I know relevance is a huge topic, so I like to think it, of it in terms of three spheres of relevance. And I've written an article, a blog post about this that kind of explains the three spheres. Uh, and the, that's, it's called Considering Relevance. It's for NCPH, their History at Work blog. If you just Google that and my name, you can find it pretty easily. Uh, but the three spheres are history as a discipline, we have to make a case, if we're a history organization, that history is relevant. And it should be obvious, but it's not. I mean, with, with everyone else trying to make their case for their importance, um, from science to, well, STEM, art, everyone, we need to be very clear and, and constant about making our case for why history is important, the study of history. So that's the first sphere. The second sphere is, as an organization within a community, we have to find ways all the time, constantly, to be relevant to our community, whoever those audiences are. And our audiences might shift over time, uh, but we also have to think in terms of different audiences. There's not just one audience, as we all know. And then the third sphere of relevance, we're going from the macro to the micro, you see, is relevance of an organization to the individual uh, it engages. So the individual that's coming through your door or coming to your website, how do you strive to find ways to be relevant to, to that person? So um, you're not going to be, I would say that you're not prioritizing all of these all the time. Some organizations might be focusing on one for a season and then focusing on another more. I mean, it, it will vary by organization for sure. Tim, can I just mention, I think everyone in this audience, because they're history people, um, knows, but for if there is anyone, NCPH is the National Council for Public History, just in case you don't have that. Right. And if you don't, you should check out their resources. Right. So let's just start briefly with history relevance as a discipline. Um, what do you think when you hear the word history? We're not going to go into this. I would spend some time on this in a workshop. 
but I'm guessing because you work in the field, I'm assuming that everyone on this call works in the history field, your, your uh, definition of history, the words that you associate with history are going to be different than some of your friends and family. Uh, if we took a poll out there, and we all know this, that some people hate history, uh, some people think it's boring, stodgy, you know the words that people might say. Um, fortunately, I'm very excited that there are two studies in the works. One is through ASLH, American Association for State and Local History. Another is the American Historical Association. They got funds to do studies that look at the divide between what people in the field think about history and what the general public thinks about history. So that's in progress. I'm very excited about that. Um, again, that gets right back to the value, value and relevance again. If you think something's boring, you, it, you don't value it, right? Um, we all know people, I'm guessing, that don't like to go to history museums. It could be for many reasons, but it also could be for either they thought history was boring in school because they were forced to memorize dates and names, um, or they're a hands-on learner, and in times past, history museums had everything in cases, and they couldn't touch anything, and they didn't like to read, and so they, the learning style turned them off. There are many, many reasons, obviously. Um, the value of history statement, um, hopefully you've seen this. If you haven't, um, I would encourage you to, to look at it. It's at historyrelevance.com. This is a document that History Relevance Initiative worked on for a long time and got the input from lots of people in the field, from various professional conferences, AAM, um, ASLH, NCPH, which Ken just mentioned, American Historical Association, even National History Day. We talked to teachers and students. Um, lots of different types of people to come up with these seven categories. And I'm not going to go through each one now, but um, they're defined on that um, on the website, and you can print out the PDF and use it. And the goal with this is really to provide a unified language that the field can use. Um, again, you're not going to every organization is not going to place emphasis on the same ones, but as you talk to your board members, even your chambers of commerce whoever your different audiences are, your stakeholders, you should always be saying why history as a discipline is important, what we learn from history. And so you can see the, the different topics there from, there's some that are more economic focused, uh, some are critical skills. You know, with science, we always hear the skill sets that science teaches, but I don't often hear us talking to community members about the skill sets that history teaches, like multiple perspectives, critical thinking. It's really the historical thinking. Uh, legacy people understand. Leadership, we should, be for, we should be looking to history for great examples of leaders in the past. Our identity as a community obviously is rooted in its history. So, I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and also, um, as a kind of incentive to get involved, we, we challenged organizations to endorse, not, not individuals, but organizations to endorse the value of history statement. So over the past three or so years, we've been collecting endorsements all around the country. I think, I can't remember how many we're up to now. You can, you can see them all on the website, who's endorsed it. It's a nice variety of organizations. And to, to endorse it, we're not asking anything of you other than that you say you believe in this and that you plan to use it with, with your different stakeholders. And we also understand that people will adopt it to, the, adapt it to their own needs. Um, but we really want people to make this statement, the value of history statement, their own and to really use it. And Ken has an example. Well, yeah, I do. Um, so some of you may be familiar with uh, the book Max von Bolgoy and I put out just the end of last year, Reimagining Historic House Museums. And we valued it so much that we actually included the value of history statement right in the book. Uh, Max also was someone on the planning um, who worked with Tim 
and a group of other people to craft the value of history statement and other statements. It's a great website that Tim mentioned, so please do go and check it out. So we felt it was very, very valuable to do that. And Tim, if you go to the next slide, um, I want to give you an example of how um, I am in my work uh, using the value of history statement and the outline that Tim just showed you. And there are a number of different ways you can use it. Um, I saw that uh, Tim has featured the Sudbury Historical Society from Sudbury, Massachusetts, ran an article on the seven ways history is essential for their members. So you can incorporate some of what's already given on the website into your own work. It's there to use. So yeah. at Historic New England, I'm working in the development office now, about a third of my time, and we're, we've taken the value of history statement and are crafting that to our own needs to show our donors how important and valuable history is. We're adapting that to the work that we do at Historic New England, but we're using that value of history statement. So it's really, really uh, been very useful for us, and we will be using that with, with our donors. So that's, that's one example I just wanted to give, uh, give to this group, Tim. Thanks, thanks. Another useful resource uh, in terms of, of books is um, Art, The Art of Relevance by Nina Simon. Some of you may have heard of this or read it. Um, Nina comes from, I know most recently she worked, she was director of, she has a more art, art focus, I should say, less history. So her, her lens that she looks through, at least for in writing this book, was more art focused. Um, it has some great quotes though, and I think it's worth reading. Uh, here's one of the quotes, I'll let you read that. Again, value comes up. So I think most people do connect relevance and value. I'm curious if anyone has read the, her book. Uh, uh, we've to... got some chat here that um, Martha Dubinas has, has another great book. Here's another quote. I, I have pages of quotes and a fun activity I do in the workshop with her quotes, but I'll let you read these quotes. And of course, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about the, that first quote there, you can make something relevant to anyone. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. That second quote, I, I often, in my years in history museums and doing evaluation, we always, we always tend to talk to visitors in the museum, right? When we do evaluations, um, we do um, entrance, exit surveys. Rarely have I worked a place, if ever, that has gone to local malls or local public places and asked people who don't aren't coming to your museum what they think about history or your museum or or other topics. Oh, here's one more quote I have from Nina. She also has some really good case studies in the book. Um, one from England in, in particular that I remember of a whole building that transformed itself, an old industrial building. Any other comments? People are just saying they like the book. Okay. It's been around for a little while, so. Yeah. So let's, go ahead, Ken, you were gonna no, leave no, no, you want to talk about this one? Okay, so that this is a question that a lot of people struggle with. Um, should your organization attempt to be relevant to everyone? Can you even be relevant to everyone? Um, it's a really meaty question. Um, I'd be curious to know what people think. 
Yeah, if anyone has any comments uh, or any experience, please put them in the chat. Of course, everyone means those people in your community, those people that come to your come to your place or use your product or Tim, the one thing I, I want to point out here is that, you know, I, you know, going back to my days as director of a historical society, um, unless people see themselves represented in your facility, right. um, there's no reason for them really to come. And, right. you know, at Historic New England, one example is that you know, we can't, I don't think we can be relevant to everyone at this point. We want to try and reach out to as many people as we can. And I've got another case example coming up in a few minutes. We're at halfway mark here. Uh, so I, I did want to say, though, that we are making an effort. And I think that's what you have to do. In any of our exhibitions now, uh, we've got a great curator who's making sure that she's incorporating different voices into it. So when we worked with Chris Dynamire, who's on this call, on a, a you know a typical historic New England exhibition on hats and shoes, but we made sure to reach out through connections we already had to the African American community to incorporate material into the exhibition. With the LGBTQ, uh, we had these great disco boots. Uh, you went with spangles; they were wonderful. Um, and um, you know, little things like that makes sense. You know, you're making an effort, and I think that's what we have to do to be more welcoming and relevant. And it is gonna take time. It's absolutely gonna take time to build those relationships. And uh, Ray Radigan says, nothing is relevant to everyone, but everything is relevant to someone. Oh, I like that. That is a uh, great quote. That is, that is really good. Uh, you know, when someone else said, uh, Martha said through specific programming, you can attract a wide number of interests in your community. And I think that that is, is true. But you can't do one-shot deals. These things have to be, you know, sustained. Good. Yeah, great. Um, so we're so, switching now. We're switching to focus on the community now. Relevance to the community. So that yeah. second year. So I'm just gonna give a quick example. Uh, you heard me say I'm um, vice president of the board of the House of Seven Gables and Tim, it was very funny. I got an email from the president of the organization today, not knowing I was doing this. We have to sign <laughs> in to uh, history relevant. Can we do Seriously? that? And then they're like, yes, <laughs> how timely of you. I was gonna bring it up to the board. Uh, but the House does of Seven every, Gables- Does everyone know where that is? You should say it's in Salem. Oh, yes. Salem, yeah, it says it there, Salem, Mass. So, oh, there, right. there, I, like all of you who are on this call, we all have very busy lives. And the only reason I decided to go on the board here when asked is because this is an organization that I do think is relevant to its community. And when Tim's talking about community, where you know, can you be relevant to everyone? Uh, there are many different communities. We serve tourists. Um, that's a big part of our audience and where we get a lot of our money. And that is something we have to understand. We have the local community broader, but very specifically, this house was saved as part of the settlement movement. And the house was saved to fund a settlement house. And we still, next slide, Tim, um, we still keep up those, uh, that mission. And this is a, another thing. Um, you know, we keep up the settlement mission. We do ESL programming um, as part of what we do. Unfortunately, suspended because of the pandemic. Um, really hard decision to do, but reality. Um, but this is something that we've continued to do. And the community has changed. Our community, when we set up the Gables, uh, was a Polish immigrant. And they were teaching people to become Americans. Um, now we have a large Latinx community. So we changed the kind of programming, ESL, and next please, Tim. Um, and I only decided to do this because of the relevance and it felt meaningful to me to do all of this. Um, so we do community conversations. 
uh, with people in the community. Um, and um, we do Caribbean Connections. This is a summer program, unfortunately canceled because of the pandemic, pandemic for the Latinx community. And it's about the, the connection Salem had with the Caribbean, where many of the new residents are from. So I think, you know, this is a good example of using your institution to be relevant, looking at your history, finding those connections. And again, I want to point this out, and we talk about this in our book, Max and I, it has to go to your mission, too. You know, I think that's really important. Um, and that's, you know, just one example I wanted to give of feeling engaged and being relevant. But can I, Tim, take one more second? Um, because I think a lot of us today have been, you know, our world has changed not just because of the pandemic, but because of the jo uh, George Floyd killing, the uh, protests that have been going on. And many of you have probably seen or even issued statements um, about, you know, what's going on today and making the connections with the past. So I'm gonna read you two sentences from Lonnie Bunch, um, who is, is now Amazonian, head of the Smithsonian Institution. Many of you know him from the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC. And yesterday, um, I think it was yesterday, he issued a statement of the day before. I'm just gonna read these two. Although it may be a monumental task, the past is replete with examples of ordinary people working together to overcome seemingly insurmountable challenges. History is a guide to a better future and demonstrates that we can become a better society, but only if we collectively demand it from each other and from the institutions responsible for administrating justice. So here he is, you know, relating it to history. And his letter is much longer and talks more about history. So I, I think, you know, here's a good example of how, you know, history is really relevant to what's going on in our world today. Tim, I turn it back to quote. you. Great quote. Great quote. Um, so when we embarked, when we, the History Relevance Initiative people, embarked on this, we were looking for great examples nationally of organizations that we thought were doing really relevant programming and we could use as examples to the rest of the field. And it was Frankly, and to be blunt, it was a big challenge to find really good programs. In part, we were also looking for programs where they documented, evaluated them, and we had um, documentation and analysis of the, the data collected. And I think we all probably know the history museums aren't, aren't always good about doing evaluation because evaluation takes time and costs money, and we know that. Um, but some of the ones that we talk about a lot, uh, I'll just mention three and you can look, you might be familiar with them. One of course is the Harry Beecher Stowe House in Hartford, which has been doing a lot in the past couple of years to try to be more relevant. Um, Eastern State Penitentiary is a historic prison in Philadelphia, downtown Philadelphia, and they have been getting a lot of attention in museum circles for what they're trying to do in, in what they're trying to talk about and relating their content to the prison system today. And uh, the third one I'll mention is Lincoln's Cottage, President Lincoln's Cottage, which is in Washington, DC. It's uh, part of the National Trust. It's three miles north of the White House and they did a temporary exhibit called, uh, well, it was about uh, human trafficking and connecting uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln worked on at that site with today, human trafficking today, it was a temporary exhibit, but out of that was a, um, came a high school student, program for high school students. It was supposed to be temporary, but one of the parents funded it for many years to come, and it became an international program teaching students about human trafficking and um, connecting it to the history of the Emancipation Proclamation, and it's it's a great, great example, and there's a lot been written about it. You can find videos on it on YouTube about it. Um, Tim, can I take a step in for just a second? Remind oh. people because we're going to get on to questions. Where Tim, we've got 20 minutes left. Okay. Uh, people have questions, comments. Uh, there's some great ones coming in. Please, please take advantage of doing that because we want to give you some time for for questions. 
Okay. Um, I said we would get talk about fascinating versus relevant. Um, here's an example of a some content that might be fascinating to some, might be very challenging to make relevant to others. So the Shakers in, in Pleasant Hills in Kentucky, but I know New England has some Shaker um, historic sites. So fascinating or relevant. You don't have to read all of this, but this is a bunch of facts about Shakers. Um, the, I have a friend who works at the Shaker um, historic site, Pleasant Hill in Kentucky, and he says, how do you make a group of celibate religious furniture makers known for shaking when they dance, how do you make them relevant to today's society? And that's a great question. Um, and one way you can tackle that is to think in terms of this continuum of facts on one end and themes on the other. So universals or themes. So does your site require that you uh, force feed visitors with lots of facts and dates and names? Or are you more willing to talk in broad generalizations and universals? So a question is for you to answer is where is your organization on this continuum? Do you default to the dates and names? Or what happens if you defaulted to, to themes, universals? Love to hear from some people. So I guess I can use this. I'll just use one example. And it's in New York State, so hopefully it won't offend anyone. But it's park service. So I was traveling through upstate New York and stopped at Martin Van Buren's house, who is, to me, an obscure president. I couldn't even remember which president he was. or. Uh, I didn't really know much about him from history class, even though I have a graduate degree in history. Um, and I took a great tour of the house. It was led by a park ranger. Um, and at the end, I took her aside, just her, and said, can I ask you a question? Why should I care about Martin Van Buren? And to be honest, she didn't have a good answer. And I thought, that is a problem if, if a site like that is not making a president relevant. Um, well, I, I, I'm going to give you one thing, just trivia, because I know we're on time. Um, I use this. Uh, he was not born a native speaker. Right. He's the he only did. president that was a uh, non-native speaker. The only president who was born in America, not the colonies, who was not an English native speaker. Can we right. make connections with that today to other people? I would say. And I guess, you know, I usually give out a book if anyone can tell me what language he spoke. I can, but, I can, but we'll let people wonder. Yes. Well, we've got a couple people here who say we try to do both, but lean towards facts, but they have done some thematic programming. Yes, Abigail knows. One of my students got it. Dutch. Yes, Ray got it. Okay. <laughs> you can talk to me about a book later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a relative. Okay, interesting. Tim, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. So that's okay. So this is, uh, in thinking of the three phases, um, or the three spheres of relevance, this is more the individual, you know, the tours, the uh, on site, the website. So that's the area we're talking about right now of relevance. Um, so I talked about two tools uh, produced by the History Relevance Initiative. This is the second one that just debuted in March, this past March. Uh, Again, we, we got feedback. We had a period of about five or six months of feedback from the field. Uh, and the feedback resulted in five qualities of a relevant history experience. We started out with six, so we kind of combined some. But these are, these are the, the five. And um, again, this is on historyrelevance.com. You can see them uh, explained a little more. But I think the, the statement here is important. Um, so relevance, like we said earlier, is in the eye of the beholder. It's in the eye of the audience. A relevant history experience is one in which the audience connects through impactful and applicable programs that are timely and rooted in historical quality. So again, we're not saying that every single program or product that we produce have to have, has to have all five of these qualities. 
but we hope that this will be a framework or a lens through when you're planning a program that you think about all of these. How can you make, uh, how can you use these and incorporate them into your program? And we think that if you do, it'll make it even more valuable to your audience. Right. Certainly, I think as history sites, we could do a much better job, and it's scary, and I think that's why a lot of us don't do it, is to connect our content, the past content, with what's going on today, which is what you just talked about with languages and second languages. Right. Right. So I hope you'll take some time um, to look at this and consider using it. Um, so what are we, how are we on time? I think we're, uh, we've got time for questions now. We're, we're good. So anyone has any or anything to share, uh, please do. Uh, I would, I would just, I would just end by saying relevance is a mindset that we need to be constantly thinking about and finding ways to measure it. That's kind of the next step. I think in our, in our field, we have to do a better job of, of collecting data about not just demographics of our visitors, but how valuable what we're doing is to them. We need to have that evidence to show our funders, I think. Yeah, and, and Tim, as I said, um, oh, we just got an, in, you just got an endorsement from the Wayside Inn. They're going back right. and putting one in, so thank you. Um, but the, that's exactly what we're doing with our donors and letting them know Another thing I want to add into this mix, and Tim and I talked about this a, a while back, is that some of you may have seen on the front page of the Boston Globe about a month or so ago, uh, the, uh, an article about what museums do for their community and do for the state of Massachusetts or your own state, you know, and the fact that, you know, we do so much to bring people into our states because they come here because they're interested in history they want to learn but you know we also pump money into the economy too you know i think that's a part of of uh, we're essential in our communities we hire people from our communities our donors are from our community because they value the work and it, that's what i'm doing with historic new england if we can let them know why historic history is so important I think that's something that we're not as good at doing either, Tim, is, you know, saying, hey, you know, we employ these people in the community. We use the caterers in the community here, you know, and we're do providing really useful services and meaningful uh, content to people in our communities. And I think that positions us better um, in, in the field, in our communities, if we can be articulate about that. Um, there's some great so, uh, comments here, Ken. Yeah, we are. Yeah. So uh, the one from Ellen Snyder. You should. Yeah, that's Ellen was asking about. Um, so uh, Ellen, uh, we're just. She was asking about incorporating the value of history statement in our development work. This is ongoing. We've actually crafted a statement yet, but we haven't finalized it. So I don't have the results yet. But I was really pleased that, you know, I brought it to our development office that they said, yeah, this is absolutely what we're doing and we're adapting it to give specific examples of how we're doing that at our, our site. But I cannot tell you yet how the funders are responding to it. Um, and Hi, Paige. I know Paige. That's a great, we should address Paige's Go question. ahead. Why don't you? Go ahead. Um, tell what it is. She says, my organization has been challenged by a young person in our small community in Maine to address civil rights crisis and take responsibility for our role in teaching the past instead of having our usual content and activities up front. Any comments on historical societies making statements which conservative communities may find to be political? Um, I think the first part of that would be explaining what, what history is. The discipline of history is about multiple perspectives. Um, a lot of people don't even understand that interpretations change over time. Um, that's the that's the basic level of of just explaining what history is. Um, I don't know. It's tricky if your mission of your organization does not connect as well with civil rights. What would you say, Ken? In that in that case? Yeah. Um... 
I, I think, you know, it's, wouldn't that be a great way to have a dialogue though with this person to create some kind of program dialogue and a facilitated dialogue? I know that, you know, we've, we've done that um, at our Langdon house. I, I was on a panel to have a facilitated discussion to talk about issues of race. And if someone brought it to, to your small community, your organization, um, with the facilitated dialogue, you get the right person. I think that's a great opportunity to have a conversation. I would, I, I would use that. Um, and, I, I, and, and I do have to agree though, Tim, sorry, that comments on making a statement, which conservatives might, conservative society communities may find to be political. Chris Denemeyer says this, you may cost some visitorship. I, I can tell you when I was on the board of AASLH and I brought this up to Tim and Heather, when we issued a statement, we got some political statement taking a stance against a, a wrong that we saw going on. We got some people who resigned. And I know some of the comments that have recently gone out about uh, the protests and the George Floyd killing that we've gotten some bad, we've gotten some feedback from people. I don't think you should do it. Well, that is going to happen. That's reality. You have to go into this knowing that that may happen. And you have to weigh in your organizations, you know, the benefits of not doing something or doing something. So I think, yeah, you have to go into that knowing it, it might cost you some, some vis visitorship or donors or just, you know. I would also say, I would also say that um, I've written a little bit about historical thinking and our responsibility as history organizations to teach what historical thinking is and the history process. I, I believe strongly that we have an obligation to come alongside formal, alongside formal educators and really teach community about what history is, historical thinking, multiple perspectives, all of that. And that could, that could be having a program that focuses on the process of history in a fun way. So I think that's another good example. Yeah. Uh, did you see we've got a comment about a tough challenge after World War II? This is from Ronald Taylor was to establish the history of the Holocaust so that the German and Jewish people could begin to heal. That's that. Uh, yes. And I think that that could still be be um, a tough challenge with with certain segments of the community. Uh, I mean, that's an issue of relevancy today. I mean, look, look what's going on in parts of our country. And if we can talk about some of these things honestly and openly through a discussion, and there are ways of doing that. There are resources out there. The National Park Service has a great uh, site that they use for their uh, interpreters on training with facilitated discussion. Because what, what if you do get someone who is belligerent, you know? And the, Tim, you mentioned a great example the House um, Stowe Center does these facilitated, dis does discussions as part of their tours. And they're actually trained on how do you do that if someone tries to dominate a conversation? Um, how do you do that if they disagree and with, you know, it's okay to disagree, but if you're being belligerent. So those are things, you know, um, and someone said, yes, history plus safe talk rules, again from Ronald Taylor. Um, yeah, but those are things that, you know, you should know about and consider. Um, and I can try and make that National Park Service training material available to people, Heather, if I can, later. Yeah, uh, I could um, put the link up on the NEMA website um, along okay. with the description of this one. Great. I will do that. I will post that for people. I find it really, really, it doesn't solve all your questions, but... You know, I'm doing some training for LGBTQ, interpreting LGBTQ history, and this has come up too um, in our discussions about how do you, you know, how, what if you get a visitor who's unhappy about the fact that you're talking about queer history? Okay. Other comments, chats, questions here? So like I said at the beginning, this was kind of a big overview. Um, if you'd like to go deeper, I'm happy to. I do have a workshop that I, I give half day or whole day. 
I forgot to mention what Tim has boiled for, down to us for one hour, he does in a full day workshop around the country. So we could only touch on things and it's much more, you know, involving when you're working in groups, which hopefully we can all get to do sometime in the, in the near future. But we right. had to boil it down. So this was kind of an experiment. Um, I just want to say, you know, thanks to everyone for joining us in what we hope would be a good discussion. Tim? I would love to hear feedback at any point. Feel free. Let me put our contact information back up. Back up. I can also put it on the NEMA website too. I mean, um, Tim, you definitely have history relevance. Um, your link is there too as well. Yeah. Okay. There you go. It should. I don't think you clicked it all the way. I know. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Anyways, yeah. Yeah, feel free to reach out to any of us if we can help. And there you go. Um, Heather, thank you for hosting us. And thank you for suggesting this. This was great. Um, I appreciate that you um, put us in touch with Tim and stuff like that. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the chat, um, Nima has actually signed on to the statement. Um, we were signed on it years and years ago. So, and stuff like that. So we were happy to have Tim um, be able to present the webinar and stuff like that. As they mentioned, they did boil this all down to a hour presentation. Um, so if you do want to continue the conversation, definitely um, get in touch with Tim and um, Ken on that one. Um, Nancy said- Can I also just there. mention that I have a brand new book out that came out last week? <laughs> oh, Tim, put a plug in. We've got yeah, one minute Yeah, put left. a plug in. You, you have time. It's Star, <laughs> called Star Spangled. It's nonfiction, history nonfiction targeting ages 10 to 14, um, but it's available on, on all, at all booksellers. Um, but it's, it's really the history of um, the Battle of Baltimore and the flag and the anthem. But what I tried to do is, is feature multiple perspectives and kind of weave historical thinking throughout the book to teach kids a little bit about the historical process. So check it out, Star Spangled. <laughs> That's Good. great. So I just want to wrap up, say thank you um, to everybody and hope to see you at a future NEMA webinar, town hall, networking event, workshop. Uh, we have our annual conference coming up in November. We have gone virtual and our call for proposals is open again. So if you guys have any um, new topics that you'd like to discuss um, after everything that's gone on in the last three months uh, about the changing museum field, definitely check out the NEMA website for that information. And Scarlett's already put all of my links in there on the website for conference and the event calendar. And so if you actually have any suggestions for future, future programming, definitely be in touch with the NEMA staff. Uh, we're open to a bunch of different things right now. So definitely get in touch with us. And I wanna thank Ken and Tim again and everybody from joining us and hope to see you at a future event. Thanks, you guys. Okay, thank you Bye. all. Bye. 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 Right on time. Yeah, yep. good. <laughs>